So launching back into this, if everybody's ready, <clears throat> what we're going to get into now is how this is different than constituency par parsing. Okay, so we did those parse trees and we talked about um, how we can use those to help us mostly like kind of chat box interactions, etc. And I said that the, the difference here is, <coughs> excuse me, I think I'm done. Um, the, the main difference between constituency parsing and dependency parsing or dependency grammar is that dependency grammar focuses usually on what's called the head. And we talked about how verbs are often the head of a sentence because they determine what kinds of words can occur in a sentence as well as what kinds of relationships can occur in a sentence. So generally, some of the rules for heads is they have to determine the way a sentence can be made. And nouns don't necessarily do that, so that's why verbs are more important. They determine the semantic class of the constructions in the sentence. And this is present tense, past tense. Has, um, they don't do possessive, not verbs anyway. Uh, plurals and for verbs, the type of verb, right? Is it transitive or non transitive? Heads are required, dependents are optional. So a sentence has to have a verb. Okay? Even simple sentences like yes, that is technically considered a verb. Okay? It's an implied asset. The morphological form of the dependent is determined by the head. And that means that's the kind of plural past tense kind of rules. So a head will tell you what form to expect. And let's just take an example using a different one. So the head here is on the left. The right hand rule is what is in the head. So this one is a preposition phrase. And so generally we break preposition phrase to phrases into prepositions and noun phrases. So this was where our preposition is in the front and the noun phrase is dependent on that preposition. And that's really common from the I shot the elephant in my pajamas. So the in my pajamas is a preposition phrase that is dependent on, that the noun phrase is dependent on that preposition. And this kind of conceptualizing things this way as left hand heads, right hand rules is actually the same idea as constituency grammar. It's just making the dependency where that noun refers back to more explicit. So I have a whole section here on how verbs are special because they are. Right? So let's look at verbs. Um, we could have a verb phrase that is a verb and an adjective like was. I was tired earlier, so I took a nap. Right? That's why I said seven o'clock coffee. A uh, verb phrase is a verb and a noun phrase. So a verb example might be saw. So I saw the dog. She's um, tripoding around. And then a verb in another sentence. So this just gets us back to recursion where we started one of these lectures. So thought, I thought it was Wednesday earlier. And then another one where it could be a verb, a noun phrase, and another preposition phrase. So these are um, clauses that are verbs that require direct and indirect objects. Okay? So I put the leash on the dog. So I'll give some examples below. I made them up as I went, but the squirrel was frightened. So that's a verb and an adjective. Chatterer saw the bear. It's a verb and a noun phrase. Chatterer thought Buster was angry. Verb and a sentence. Joe put the fish on the log, which is a verb, a noun phrase, a fish on the log, preposition phrase. And this is why often verbs are considered the head and they're special because they have all these explicit rules about what can and can't come next depending on the specific verb you pick. So in reality, what's happening is the, spe the specific verb is driving what's happening here, not just the fact that it is a verb. So uh, just some general rules, like things that you learn, right, was can have an adjective, saw can have a noun phrase, thought can have a sentence, um, put can have both. Okay. 
And that seems like it's probably a lot of weird combinations. Like, oh my God, I'd have to go through all of the language, the target language, and um, hand code all of these. But thankfully, we've already kind of given them labels. So each one of those verbs is a special type of verb. And there are rules on what can occur with their complements. Okay. So we could say they're constituents. This is one of the problems with this field is that We've borrowed terms from linguistics, from psychology, from computer science. So um, technically, the words that occur with verbs are considered complements, but we've been calling them constituents. It doesn't really matter. Okay? Um, I like calling them slots because there's a slot the word fits into. And that's just kind of an appealing metaphor. <clears throat> if you try to mix and match, you will find this doesn't work. So was cannot be paired with another sentence here. Saw cannot be paired with just an adjective. Thought cannot be paired with just a noun. And put cannot be paired with just a preposition phrase. So this kind of quickly allows you to figure out the patterns that are available. So all that uh, part of speech processing that we talked about doing, and you guys were like, when could we use this? Here's a good spot. You can figure out which type of verb is by examining old. Uh, pre-tagged data to know this particular word always has to have a sentence after it, or this particular one probabilistically always has an adjective. So obviously this isn't perfect because English, I mean all languages are weird, but I like to make the joke at the expense of English because it's a silly language sometimes. Um, there are of course verbs that can do a lot of things. And so they might have different probabilities of what could come next. Could be verb, ad, adverb phrase, could be verb, um, noun phrase, right, verb sentence. But you could look at a set of processed speech and figure out what the combinations are. And so that's where things like Brown can actually be very useful because while the text contained in Brown may not be uh, up to date anymore, the ver the like phrasal structures don't change that often. So, verbs have different dependents, and those different dependents have different valencies, is what this is called. I don't like this term, valencies, here, because we're going to talk about sentiment soon, and um, sentiment is considered valent, the strength of the emotion, uh, but if you see this term described with a, a verb, what they're talking about generally is um, different types of verbs have different possible options. And so we'd really need to find and think about when writing our own grammar that um, we'd have the right verb matched with its verb phrase. Okay? So this verb requires this kind of verb phrase. So the verb gets matched correctly with its constituent. So there's another section um, that we don't cover anymore, but it's in the NLTK book on feature grammars. And feature grammars really focus on that specific task, but it gets complex real fast. Okay. Um, especially once you start considering conjugations. Um, so present tense, past tense, third person, present tense, like I walk, you walk, they walk, he walk, he walks with an S. Right? So there is a lot of, there are a lot of weird rules. And then we create these subcategories and we just assign specific verbs to specific verb complement groups. And so a simple example is that transitive verbs require some sort of direct object, which would be a noun phrase. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, ditransitive verbs require a direct object and an indirect object, which would be the noun phrase, preposition phrase combination. <coughs> Excuse me. So Here's some more examples of types of verbs. Okay. Intransitive verbs, like barked, does not require any kind of option after it. It could be, you could have verb preposition phrase, he barked at the neighbor, okay, or at the mailman, but you don't have to. Okay. Transitive verbs require some sort of direct object. Okay. Dietive or ditransitive verbs um, require both a direct object and an indirect object, which is ver a noun phrase, verb phrase, uh, preposition phrase, noun phrase, preposition phrase. 
heading back to the man. Sentinel verbs uh, are ones that require a sentence. So uh, said, thought, think. <clears throat> so another piece to consider are modifiers. So prepositional phrases, adjectives, and we have barely touched the magic nonsense that is adverbs. Okay. Adverbs are very tricky, I think, in English because, oops, I forgot I had Slack open. Um, and I have do not disturb turned on, so let me just close Slack. Because otherwise, when they get to talking, oh my gosh, they'll be clicking all night. There we go. So, um, back to adverbs. Adverbs in English can be very complicated because there are people who think um, that they can only go in front of the, the verb, or they can only go after the verb, or you can stick them where the heck you want. So, adverbs are also kind of um, problematic for processing because it depends on the style of the writer. Okay? Because the rules, while traditional rules hold you do it this way, um, and I don't even remember if I know what that is anymore, um, uh, there are lots of ways that people actually do it. So like slowly, he walked slowly. That's okay. Uh, he slowly walked. To me, that's also okay. So which way should it be? Right? Uh, and so if you make the verb the head, Right, that adverb has got to either go backwards or forwards. Um, so unlike complements, okay, modifiers are optional, um, and there can be a lot of them, especially when we get into adjectives. So here's an example with the word really, which um, is a is a weird adverb, right? The squirrel really was frightened. I could say the squirrel was really frightened. Chatter really saw the bear. We wouldn't say saw really though. Okay. Cheddar really thought Buster was angry. Uh, and Joe really put the fish on the lock. So often the adverb requires looking at this, mostly being in front, but not always. So do we make it its own clause, right? an adverb phrase? Or do we just make it at the end of the noun phrase? Like, where does it go? Right. So adverbs are kind of tricky. Now, in dependency parsing, not so hard because we're not building that tree. Instead, we're just saying, well, it modifies the verb. That is the purpose of an adverb. All right, so we can get basic dependency parsing from the NLP function. And I would tell you, if you're going to do any of this kind of work, just use the one they have, unless you have very specific rules that you want, mostly because the one that Spacey has is so great. But we will train our own a very small one. Uh, so the pre-built model, the English model we've downloaded, remember that it does everything. It does entity recognition, part of speech tagging, uh, dependency parsing, something like <laughs> limitization, tokenization, like that's the point is that their model that they give, that they've handed out to people does all of it. Okay. <clears throat> all right. So I'm going to import Spacey here. I'm also going to import Displacey because that's an adorable name. We're going to make some pretty pictures. And so let's see here. The U.S. unveils the world's most powerful supercomputer. Loaded up our Spacey model and run our NLP function on the sentence. So now we have the part of the speech, the limits, blah, blah, blah. Um, <clears throat> now I will tell you, I've been talking to Jonathan about this cool function called UD uh, package in R, if I can spell it correctly, uh, called UD pipe. So the package is UD pipe. And it is essentially, so I gotta update my notes for next semester. Um, it is essentially a very similar form of Spacey that has a bunch and bunch of languages as well and um, uh, looks if you look at the output from uh, UD pipe and look at the output from Spacey it's actually very similar okay. so if you're trying to do some stuff in R and you don't want to use Spacey there is a Spacey R package but it's literally just a wrapper for Python so you might as well just 
you know, if you get an error message, you've got to figure out the Python error message. So you might as well understand it in both. Um, but man, I've been working with this thing the last week or so, and it is super cool. So that's an update. If you want to focus more on R and do some of the stuff that Spacey's doing, UDPipe is pretty cool. FYI. Now, I have not made it do any of the stuff we're about to do, but I, from the looks of it, it, it works pretty well. All right. Now, this is just some like faint formatting that give you an example of making a text picture of a dependency tree. Uh, this is just mainly for show, but for each token, print out, and this kind of format here allows you to kind of fill in. So for each one of these pieces, it's going to fill in. So token text will go in zero, the tag, the part of speech tag in one, the dependency tag in two, the head text, so the, uh, the next, the head of the, of the piece, the next one out, and it's tag as well. So what we see is that world modifies US, world also links over to unveils, supercomputer links to world, it's possessive, um, <clears throat> powerful links to most, supercomputer to powerful, supercomputer is considered the root in their sentence, okay. and then a punctuation. Let's look at that in a more visual way. Okay. I love display C. It's cool. It's pretty. Okay. So one thing to notice when you're doing this on your homework, okay. this. Markdown chunks, sometimes like, let's say if I run this, I don't know how long this will take, we'll see. So I, this happens every semester. So put a note, could not find file shift. Whoops. What are you doing to me? Threefold. There are days where these things make me crazy. Today is one of them. R and I only moderately getting along today. All right, back to this example. Ah, here's what'll happen. Okay, so this is what I'm trying to show you. If you're running this and running one chunk at a time, you know, as you do to make sure your work works, so to speak, what you'll get is this. Okay. That's okay because that is just how it's going to display in line. So if display C doesn't, um, it'll display in line in Jupyter, I think. I think, don't quote me on this, I haven't tried it. Um, but in um, Reticulate here, it just prints out the, the code for the picture. That's okay. When you hit knit, because you have this results equals as is, you'll actually get the picture. Okay, so make sure when you're using display C, you have that extra little piece that prints out the picture as is rather than the code for the picture. Okay. All right, but to use it, you do display C dot render. Okay, you do the, the processed sentence. And then these options just control like how far apart they are, how big the arrows are, how big the words are. Okay, these are the default options that I found online that work pretty good. And then let's see what we can find here. Okay. So world here as part of this noun phrase, okay. it's actually picked supercomputer as the root, which is kind of interesting. I th would think it would pick the verb, but it, it interestingly did not. Generally, Spacey picks the verb as the root word or the head of the sentence. But anyway, so world here, has a noun modifier, the US war is, you know, uh, and then what it's, uh, it's, it's a kind of a, a mod. Um, so I don't know quite why it picked this combination because I would have said that world is modifying um, supercomputer right? because it's the world's supercomputer, it's possessive, but what it did was say, okay, well, the possessive is back this way. Uh, we have the possessive marker here for case. All right, and then supercomputer's got some adjective modifiers and then an adverb modifier, All right, most. And so I can tell from the sentence that the two important parts are uh, 
according to the moment, our worlds and supercomputer. I might process this one differently, just manually, but here's the basic output you get from Spacey. And so the dependency style is called clear style, which makes me laugh because it is not at all clear, but that's okay. And what it is, clear style, is a set of rules that help us transform a constituency tree. So we spent all of last week talking about constituency trees for a reason. Okay. What happens underneath for Spacey is it parses a constituency tree using some neural net rules that are effectively a left corner parser, right? So it does a bottom up and the top down combination together so it doesn't get stuck quite so much. And then uses the clear rules to translate that into a dependency graph. Generally, the verb is considered the head of the sentence, but not always, okay, as we just saw. There's a whole paper, not for the faint of heart, on how clear style is translated into rules. It has a lot of super, very boring technical details, but there are some really cool kind of trees that explain what's happening. If you're interested. I'm going to give you the, the main picture here. So what happens is um, the first thing that gets picked is a constituency tree. Okay. So this particular tree, um, uh, what they've done is uh, had a noun phrase here. This is a very weird sentence, peace and joy that we want, right? This is kind of a like very strangely ordered sentence, right? So technically that always indicates an extra sentence So we want. And then this weird noun phrase that actually it's, we want peace and joy, right? So it's kind of a weirdly organized one as an example. So T minus one is because it is up here instead of back here. So anyways, you input any kind of constituency tree that you might be interested in. Here's a particularly complex one. It's going to map out these empty categories. So the that here, so we want that, that referring back to peace and joy. Okay, so I just moved the that over. Handle this weird special case. So special cases often are coordinated conjunctions. So anytime you have an and, handle the general cases. So general cases are all the rules about how um, now verbs have a noun modifier. Usually preposition phrases are back onto a noun, like the kind of um, rules that we already talked about for left hand right hand splitting rules and then these secondary dependencies so this one is particularly complex because it has it's we it's ordered in a strange way okay. and so let's look at what the final output is technically they made peace the root word okay. and that refers back to peace peace and joy is the whole coordinating conjunction um, we want Here's the that, it's the direct object of the sentence, and the want is the, has a, a modifying noun phrase, so the noun subject. All right, so <clears throat> English can be done. Right? We talked about how complex English can be, and let's consider commas for a minute. As an English speaker and reader, first sentence here, I saw a girl with a telescope. That's ambiguous. We talked about this. This is the pajamas thing. So I saw a girl. I could be seeing her through my telescope, or I could say I saw her and she had a telescope. So the question is, where does that preposition phrase modify? Right? Who, who's, where's the telescope? However, with the second sentence with a comma, I saw a girl, comma, with a telescope. That makes it pretty clear that I have the telescope. And I saw a girl with my telescope is basically what's happening. Let's see how Spacey parses this. So sentence number one here. Verb, here's our root right here. So the verb has a an in subject. So in subject to this means the noun phrase that's modifying the verb. Okay. Or the noun phrase associated with the verb. It's not really the modifier, sorry. Associated with the verb. So what did we see? Well, we saw the direct object, girl, the direct object has a determinant attached to it. And then I also saw requires a direct and an indirect object. So here's the indirect object for the prepositional phrase. Um, and then 
the prepositional object and its determinant. And so in this interpretation, I saw with the telescope, because this prepositional phrase is attached to the verb, right, it's implying, because the uh, verb is, is uh, got in a subject, it implies that I saw her with a telescope because the dependency rule here is basically I saw with the telescope. Um, because instead of instead of with being attached to girl, with is attached to saw. And so you could take out, I'm just going to hold my hand in front of the screen like you could see that. You could take out the a girl I saw with a telescope. And people would be like, what did you see? But then, you know, because the saw attaches over here, that implies that you are doing the watching. Now, in reality, this sentence is pretty ambiguous, but the choice here is to have that be a verb phrase with a prepositional attachment. Now, we already said in the second sentence that's how we would interpret it because of the comma, and it gives you actually the exact same result. So in, in, in a, a reader and a speaker would interpret these maybe slightly differently, but because we're using this transformation set of rules, they don't tend to change because of the embedded kind of clause structure. Okay. So, you know, these are good systems, very good systems, but they're not perfect. They don't perfectly capture what people actually do. Okay. And we interpret punctuation in lots of interesting ways. So, um, you know, last week, I think one of you asked, like, what would I do with this? <laughs> I was like, can you hold until next week? Here we are. Okay. So a couple things. Um, let's see. And this would be really cool if you wanted to do this um, as a final project. You could use Spacey's built-in processor. You wouldn't have to build your own. But you could use Spacey's built-in processor and look at maybe tweets uh, over time about pick your favorite celebrity, pick your favorite political figure, whatever and see and use this example to see how they're described. So especially if you could find a way to look at people who've had to do like random apologies lately, like they've said something insensitive, I read too much BuzzFeed, but like you could look at the adjectives that are used to describe people over time. Um, which if you know, if you're doing election tracking can be really important. So what we do is we'd find the dependency, right? the adjective dependency, okay? because knowing the adjective is in the sentence doesn't necessarily tell you that it's a modifying that per, that particular named entity. And I'm going to use Harry Potter as an example. So what words around Harry change from the first book to the last book? So I'm going to do Philosopher's Stone versus Death and Hallows. And um, I've transferred that from R into Python, and I just um, brought over actually the first five chapters. This is chapter one, but it's actually the first five chapters, and that's just so that we won't be here all night because uh, especially the last book is quite long. Okay, the first book is kind of short, actually. Um, this, the last book is basically two novels in one. Now, when you do this kind of work, what you want to do is have one big string of text, I could do a loop and process each chapter separately, but instead I'm just going to be like, here's all of the book. And to do that, I'm going to use a join feature. We've used join a bunch, but this basically slaps together all of the chapters by sentence with a space in between them. And I just ran NLP on it. Now, here, what we're going to do is count. So I've imported the counter function because you would think Python would have a good counter object, but it doesn't really. So uh, the counter object kind of works like table in R. I'm going to start with a blank list of words. So for each sentence in the book, because okay, I told it to process all of them at once, so I'm going to think about sentences one at a time. So for each sentence, then for each word, if that word is Harry, find its children. Now, children here are words that the, um, are tied to that word as a dependent. And so what that means is it's a modifier. It's linked back 
to it. So if the word is hairy for each of the childs attached to that, because there could be multiple ones, dump those into our list. Okay, so for each sentence, look at each word. If that word is hairy, what word is related to it? And then you can print that out using the most common function, which is part of counter. This is actually like NLTK's frequency distribution function. Um, now we didn't do any kind of processing on this. So unfortunately what we do is get a lot of possessives and a lot of punctuation. But in book one, which you see is and, okay, so he's part of a list of people. Um, that list also being with Dudley. And if we get down out here to some of these adjectives, we've got poor, little, off, see, like, believe, spent. And so I could take mainly this list of um, particular adjectives and nouns that are tied to him. So let's see if that changes for book two. Oops, sorry. Still got a bunch of punctuation, but now we still see he's part of a list. But now real time, his, true, abandoned, summoned, I don't know what the C is just probably a weird book thing. Nodded? Interesting. So some of the sentence processing is being weird. Seven, confused, suggested. So we can see that a lot of the things are uh, very different. There's also a lot more. Okay. And so in that first book, there's a lot of description. Right? Harry's still the main character of both books, but like the first one has a lot of like explaining the world, building the world for you. The last book is a lot more action. And so what we see is that he's involved with more nouns and verbs and adjectives than in the first book. Now, if I were doing this, like I said, for kind of not, it's not really sentiment analysis, although I guess it kind of is, this could be a really cool way to think about how things are described. Okay? Um, especially if you're trying to capture trends. So, you know, every once in a while they have these like celebrity is over party kind of Twitter hashtags. It'd be interesting to watch and check how those change and what words are being used over time um, because some people use them sarcastically and some people don't. And so just having that sheer number of tags doesn't capture what's actually happening. <clears throat> All right, so let's try training our own. And I'll tell you, it's still like just as bad as the um, uh, entity recognition, um, personally. It's a little bit easier in the sense that this one uses um, words instead of characters, so that's a little bit nicer. But in general, it still kind of has that same complex structure. So first things first, break down the sentence that you're going to use this training data into um, a little green fart uh, tokens. Okay. So we're going to use this sentence, they trade mortgage-backed securities. And it's important to realize like how is Spacey going to break that sentence down because that's how we need to train it. So I just told it to do print out how Spacey was going to break this down. It's got some periods and dashes. and it, it's good to note that they're their own special token. Okay? They don't get added to the other tokens. So I tried to make a graph here. It's maybe not the best graph. So we have they trade mortgage backed securities. So they is word zero, trade is word one, mortgage is two, dash is three, base four, five securities, six punctuation. Do not forget. Python is a zero index language. Okay, I don't think I've said that in several weeks, so don't forget. Um, you have to start with zero. The next thing I did was label the, um, <clears throat> the type of word in relation to its dependency. So I started by making my verb the root word, and that's how you'd label it as root. And I was like, well, it's got to have a noun phrase, so they. So this is the end subject of the, the noun subject of root. Mortgage base is kind of a weird one. It's a compound phrase. So compound punctuation. Based is a noun modifier. So this whole thing is actually basically an adjective um, on the direct object here. So securities here. It's a noun, but it's a direct object. So what do they trade? Securities. 
and then the punctuation is almost always tied to the root. Here I, I tied it this punctuation to um, the based piece because it's in the middle of a phrase. Then what you do is, um, so we've added these, uh, sorry, we've added the, the, the dependency labels. And when you see the training data here, this will make sense. But these are the DBPs, the dependencies. Then you have to add the numbers. So where do those arrows point to? So as I'm going here, the first <clears throat> item is tied to item one, right? So we went from item one to item zero. So for this slot, for the zeroth slot, I would say it's related to number one. Number one here is related to itself. Everything is moving away from it. So that makes it the root. Um, that's not the only time that happens, but generally the root word is only related to itself, so it gets a one. So, so far we have one, one. Two here is tied to four, so I put four. One, one, four. Three is tied to four, so four. Four relates to five, so five. Five here is coming back to one, so another one. Six here is coming back to one to one. So what did it do? One, one, four, four, five, one, one. Okay. So we have seven items to label. Have to have seven dependency labels, subject, verb, noun, stuff, and then seven numbers. So we call them the heads for the numbers. So here's our numbers: one, one, four, four, five, one, one. You are telling it where to draw the arrows. Dependencies, you're giving them the label. However, if you're going to train your own, you can use whatever system you want. Um, so you could decide, I, I like compound is one that I think I made up. And so what that tells me is this first item here, the first item, they, is tied to the second item, trade, and is the subject of that verb. The second item, which is number one in our system here, trade, is the sentence because it's only is the root of the sentence because it's only related to itself. Okay, it's the first, it's the first slot, it's the zero of the slot, the first slot. It's only tied to itself, so the arrows are only pretty much going out, okay. etc. So how does this look when we write it all out? Okay, so let's look at one whole piece here, and then I'll show you a, a, a way to cheat. So what I want to do is open the list and then close the list. So that open and close the list is the same thing that we did for the entity recognition. Inside that list, you will have a tuple for the whole sentence. And so um, you put in the sentence first. So it needs a list of tuples. And the first slot of the tuple is a sentence. Not parsed or anything, just the whole sentence. The second slot of the tuple is a dictionary, and that dictionary has, um, okay, sorry, it goes right here, dictionary. The dictionary has two pieces, a heads component with the numbers of where to draw all the arrows, and a, a DEP, dependencies component, of the label. Now the labels can be whatever you want, just using them consistently. I just picked root to be the root word or the head of the sentence. You could have used head, but and so you don't have to use that clear styling because you're making your own. But whatever you do, because you're training this model, it is trained. Um, make sure you use the same ones over and over again. All right, so punct here. Make sure you use punct the same way every single time. Is what I'm saying. And so first part of the tuple, second part of the tuple, close that tuple. Okay, here's a second sentence. Okay, I like London and Berlin. So I is gonna like is gonna be our root word here. It refers back to number uh, to the first word, which is our in subject. Okay. London and Berlin are a direct object phrase. So I made London the direct object. This a coordinating conjunction. And then the 
um, second word the actual conjunction. So I could have called this direct object as well. Now there's a couple ways to parse this sentence, but what I did was I said, well, I is tied to like, so one. Like is tied to itself, so one. Like is tied to London, so another one. And is tied back to London. And Berlin is tied back to London because it's a compound phrase. Now you could say, uh, well, we like both, so like is also tied to Berlin. But right now I put Berlin tied to London. And then you don't forget the punctuation. So that's generally when people make a mistake here is that they've left off the marker for the punctuation. Okay, so once you build that, then, because like I said, this part's actually not terrible. It's just like, if you were to do this by hand, I think you'd lose your mind. So you're only gonna do two of them <laughs> to make it easy. Um, but one thing I like about this over the named entity recognition is there's not a lot of character counting. It is based on the, the actual tokenization of that sentence. So it's much more intuitive in the sense of it's like, okay, uh, token, like it's by word instead of by character, except you have to remember that Python's a zero language. So this is not the first item, it's the zeroth item. Now, if we go back and look at Canvas here to help you with this, what you can do is look at, am I in the right class? Yes, help coding with dependencies. Is look at some of Spacey's work here. And so let's see how it would do. I like London and Berlin. Okay. Uh, take off this punctuation one or you won't get the right answer. And then hit enter. So let's see how it picked these objects. Clearly, this is what I used. So like here is our verb, which it made the root word. Here's our in subject, our direct object, our conjunction, our coordinating conjunction, the actual and part. Okay. I labeled it C-O-N-J, but you could have labeled it proper noun and a punctuation. So here is the first half of the, the, the dependencies half. And then for the numbers, you just have to literally do some do some counting. So this one is related to number one. This one is related to number one all by itself. This one's related back to number one still. This one's related to zero, one, two, and then two, and then one. Okay. So you can use um, this sort of thing to help you visualize the sentences. Okay. I would also tell you, um, it says to use your tweets from last time. I tell you to use your short tweets. The longer sentences, the more complex this gets. Now, Spacey will also only do um, uh, projective graphs. So projective graphs do not cross each other. So there's not some like random like arrow crossing all of the rest. So if you get a projective graph error, um, you can let me know. I can help you look it up. All right. Once we have the data built into our training function, what we want to do is create a blank model, just like we did last time, so spacey.blank. We're going to add the pipe to it. So that's the second step, is always adding a pipe. Last time we did uh, an NER pipe, but now we're going to do a parser pipe. So we create the pipe and then add it to it. Then add the labels. So last time we manually added labels, right? Add label, subject, add label, train, etc. Uh, this option allows us to add all the labels at once using a loop. So what it does is in the training data, it grabs the annotations. Okay, the annotations are, let me back up here, um, the dictionary piece. So it says, okay, I'm expecting a tuple. That tuple has got a sentence. Ignore the sentence. Pull out the dictionary. In that dictionary, pull out the dependency part. So for the dependencies in the annotations dependencies section, grab the list of dependencies and just add them all. If it's seen one it's already seen before, no big deal. So this will allow you to add all of them at once. It's much more efficient than doing all of each one one at a time. All right, another piece we're going to add. So I said we're going to slowly get more complex with our learning how to work spacey here. So another piece we're going to add is what's called a loss. Okay. 
So we can look each time a model runs. Now losses can apply to any kind of model that gets trained over and over again. So any kind of, um, usually, you could do this for any normal machine learning model actually, I guess, but especially useful for um, neural net models. We have some sort of training data. So we just talked about having the dependencies and the heads um, being labeled. So we have the text, which is the word and the sentence itself, the label set. So there's actually two sets of labels on this. Um, it, you know, runs through the model and does whatever kind of model this is. So this, in um, our scenario, is a neural net model. So it's slowly changing the weights within the model. The gradient part here depends on the type of model. Um, from that model, what then happens is, given what I've just seen, can I predict the, the label? If I can predict the label and I get it right, I strengthen the weight that I had for that. If I predict the label and I get it wrong, I lower the weight that I had for that. Sometimes this is called backpropagation. There's other algorithms, but backprop is pretty popular. And so, so it's, it's exactly the way people work. Well, okay, not exactly, but... It's in the way that I hope that our new dog is learning because, man, he is a struggle bus, right? Very stubborn. So, you know, he gets something that he wants. He strengthens that behavior. He gets something that, you know, he doesn't get what he wants. He strengthens that behavior because he's stubborn. But in theory, he should lessen that behavior. That's how most of these models work. If you get the answer right, you say you add more weight to it. If you get the answer wrong, you move the weight down. And then you have an updated model, and then you just run more and more trainings. So the loss function calculates how much that gradient piece is training. Okay. So what is the difference between the example and the expected output, or basically how much is it moving those weights? So if it gets it wrong, it's going to move the weights a lot. If it gets it right, it might um, move them a little bit or a lot. It kind of depends. So um, the greater the difference, the more significant the updates to the model. And so you don't want to stop training a model that has a large loss. Okay. So losses tell you, like, the, the usefulness of the number is really like a good spot to figure out when to stop training. Because we don't want to overtrain models, especially these types of models, because then they only learn that specific example. So loss is a good measure of, like, okay, it has learned enough. Stop training. So let's look at that here. So um, we're going to begin training using our optimizer. This is the same one we used last time. And we'll run 20 iterations just to show you. And so for each iteration, shuffle the data. That's important. Don't, don't show it the same data in the same order every single time. You can split into testing, testing and training. Um, neural net models, people don't tend to do that, which I um, find kind of interesting. But um, it's always helpful if you have a secondary set of data to, to um, do like cross-validation on, that kind of thing. Um, but most people train and test on the same data for neural net models specifically. Because okay. I remember talking to, um, to some folks when I was, was learning Keras, and I was like, you don't split this data? <laughs> you train it on everything? <laughs> um, what's happening here? Uh, apparently that's pretty normal, so FYI. But shuffle, shuffle, shuffle. We're gonna save a list of losses, or I'm sorry, this is a dictionary of losses, okay? Because I could do multiple loss parameters. So if I'm trying to train NER and a parser, I can look at how much my NER has been trained and my parser has been trained. So we're gonna create a dictionary. We only have one piece, but we could have more. All right, so for each text and its annotations, so for each sentence and its heads and dependencies, we're going to update our model. Here's the sentence, so notice it's a little twofold of the sentence and its annotations. We're going to begin training our optimizer here and tell it to print out the losses. And so for each round, what we get is for the parser, because it's the only thing we're training, it's going to print out the loss. An individual loss number is not super useful, okay? But these are kind of the range you normally see them in for neural net models. Um, but in comparison to lots of rounds of data, this is very useful. Okay. So what we can see here 
is that it starts high and then at the end is low. That's good. Okay. You don't want to see a losses that continue to increase. That's a really bad sign. Okay. You want losses that start high and do this kind of exponential power function where they slowly taper off. Now, depending on how complex the data is and how much data you have, it might kind of bounce up and down. So what we see here is it's six, five, four, three, five, four, three, three. So ups and downs are normal. So over many training runs, it will smooth out this exponential curve if it's going well. Um, and you'd want to stop when it levels out. And so I, I don't have a number for you here. I'm sure someone has come up with a number somewhere, but I think it's probably not the most universally useful cutoff much like p equals 0.05, right? So I, what I, the little bit I have done this, what I tend to do is just kind of wait and see. Like, okay, let's try 20. Okay, I only really needed five. Erase that model, let's do five. Okay. And so here, while this two is a little questionable, like, okay, is, is it leveled off? Is this two a random one? So I might try running 30 instead and seeing if that's truly where it's leveled off. What you don't want to run is run 200 and have it level off at 15 because 15 runs because then that implies that you've overtrained the model. And why is overtraining bad? Uh, as a reminder, you, it will only learn those examples. Okay. So you want it to learn just enough so that it's still generalizable. All right, so we've trained our model. Now let's see what it does with a sentence. So our test sentence here is I like security. It's a very simple little sentence. And I told it to print. So here's another way to tell it to print the dependencies. I still think um, display C is so much better. And so, hey, that works pretty well. It's a, you know, I like, which like is a word that it saw in the London sentence. I is a subject modifier. Securities is this direct object modifier. Cool. And so because we're using such a small training data set, you'll want to make sure that your test data includes some of the words from above, okay. especially the verb. Okay. Otherwise, you might get something crazy, but that's okay. It's a learning experience. All right, if I want to save my model, I can just save the model, so NLP to disk. Okay, that's useful if you've run 100 training rounds and it took eight hours. You want to save it so you can load it later. You can also, um, I don't know if I have it in this lecture or if I have this in another lecture, but you can also save models uh, in each round. So as your models get more complex and you get better at this, um, I think I'm thinking of another class. 540 class, but when models take, you know, if each one takes an hour to run and you don't want to have your computer crash in the middle of it, you can actually set it in the saving model thing in the loop of training so that if something crashes, you can go back to the previous model. Okay, so saving models is really useful if you're going to run a bunch of them. And you can put the loss number in the model name, so you can pick the one with the smallest loss. All right, so let's do one more example, and then hopefully this will also get back to that question of what can I do with this? Okay. So you don't have to use the clear style markers. I just explained to you what they were because that is what Spacey is using. So it's helpful to know what those are. Okay. Uh, if you're going to train your own model, I don't care what labels you use. I don't even care what language you write them in. Just be consistent. So we could create our own system that explores the relationship between actions and maybe places and descriptions. So this would be um, kind of that same idea as Twitter, but it's going to be infinitely more useful. So this is from their website. It was either from the book or their website. Uh, but what we've got here is a training data. So the things that you say to, this is the stuff that my dad would say to, to his Android phone, like, find me a hotel near the beach, right? Find me, uh, show me a restaurant that's open, okay. which, you know, none of this right now is super useful. Uh, but what we can do is use our own embedded system to um, create 
uh, essentially a summary of what either what people are searching or a summary that we then feed into our algorithm that gives them the answer. Okay. So find a cafe with great Wi-Fi. Okay. Find here's the root. It's our, our verb in the sentence. Okay. Don't care so much about um, the A here. So a lot of these words, we just tell it, I don't, there's no dependency here. Okay. And you could tell it, um, you do still have to give it a number of where to draw the arrow to because it'll only do projective graphs. So you have to be careful when you're doing this part not to just tell them all one in case they cross. Okay. Um, believe me, you'll know when you do it wrong because it won't run. Uh, anyways, okay, so but the rest of these labels, who cares? Okay, I don't need to spend a lot of time labeling all the determinants and the prepositions. Okay. But what we end up with is an important system that says, okay, well, I've got my root word, my place word, my quality, and my attribute. Okay. So it needs to be great. Uh, and if I have a lot of this kind of data, I can use that to match. Okay. So I've got the question, right, find me a hotel near the beach, and then I have a bunch of the answers. So I have a bunch of hotels tagged with that attribute, okay, beach, and that quality is close. And so let's see if we can find, uh, create a system that does that. So I'm going to retrain this model. Okay, so I'm going to make NLP2 to figure this stuff out. Okay. Uh, add all of those labels. Tell it to train. Now notice on this one, when you have more data, <clears throat> you definitely get slightly wilder responses. Uh, and so this drops off sharply, and then it sort of figures it out. Okay. Now, while this looks like it jumps back up to two, pay close attention. This is in scientific notation. Okay. So this is actually still getting smaller. So we really, we really like hit bottom here at whatever run this is, 15 probably. Okay. So that's all we needed. So I would tell it to quit. Um, now, five extra runs is not too much overtraining. You know, 5,000 extra runs definitely is. And so now I have a system where I can um, take a question and pull out only the important dependency parts. Because right? I now have a, a, a model that says, okay, it's going to look for and it's going to find the root word, right, which is our verb in the sentence find show uh, and then it's going to find what type of thing it wants place the quality of that place and the attributes of that place and we can use that in our answering system so here are the questions here are the answers all right and this just prints it all out in a nice pretty format ignoring all of the extra superfluous words and so these are our test data pieces, and these test pieces are slightly different, but it still gets the same um, dependency combinations. Okay. So what we see is it's cheapest gym. So knowing here um, that these two go together as the quality of the gym, right? and the, the gym is the place. All right, visualizing that output, here's what it looks like. Right, find a hotel with good Wi-Fi. So we're finding a place okay, and going back. Uh, and then the hotel has an attribute, Wi-Fi, and that attribute has a quality, good. So it's not a good hotel with Wi-Fi. Right? It's a hotel that has good Wi-Fi, so which is a different question. Okay. If you were using a bag of words type model, it wouldn't know the difference because it would ignore what word good was related to. So can print out all of them. So the summary of like, what can I do with this? I think it's a, an interesting thing to help you find um, attributes that are tied to specific concepts, right? So when we did named entity recognition, we were just trying to find the concepts. Where, what are the concepts in these sentences? If you add that to this dependency parsing, I can find the attributes of those concepts. So we can find their qualities or their um, descriptor words. Because a, a hack solution for that is to just take, um, take your sentence, parse it, find all the adjectives. I'm sorry, not parse it, part of speech tag it. Find all the adjectives and just count them all up. 
Okay, that's a crude system because the adjectives and nouns, it depends on where it is in the sentence. And right? if I just count the number of good, you know, good versus bad adjectives, I don't know if they refer to my specific noun I'm interested in or not. Okay? And so it could be that, let's say you're looking at tweets and you're um, following how people feel about, let's try not to go political today, let's see. How do people feel about the weather? Okay. Um, but often what people do is take a bag of words type approach where just count up all the adjectives and show, like here's all the positive words, here's all the negative words, which we'll do here in a couple weeks. Um, that loses the context of the sentence. So one of the biggest criticisms of those types of models, like topic models, um, is that the context is ignored. This allows you to add context which can be pretty crucial if you're tracking trends in especially um, attributes. Right. So hopefully that gets back to your question from last week of what would I do with this. <clears throat> All right, scaling up. That's hard. <laughs> I think, you know, if you're going to do this, honestly, Spacey's um, built-in system is pretty good. You just have to kind of tweak it to work for you. Um, it's really hard to scale up because there are so many different types of grammatical constructions. It might be easier to write a system that kind of takes Spacey's output and converts it into something that you wanted to do. So you could use their built-in model and then change, and then basically say, you know, if this dependency exists, change this to the word quality or something like that. Um, because the training data is pretty laborious to make. And the ambiguity, although for the, the <clears throat> we talked about the ambiguity of where like prepositional phrases go, but if you're just interested in following simple dependencies, that doesn't matter so much, right? It's okay if that prepositional phrase doesn't get stuck to the right noun because you're more interested in just the general sentence, um, you know, adjectives, that kind of stuff. So, a problem for people who care about the very detailed specifics is that ambiguity issue. Okay. So as the number of possible combinations or constructions or noun phrase, verb phrase combinations expands, the ambiguity also expands. So there's a choice, a chance you're going to pick the wrong dependency. Okay. Um, I would say in general, when you average over lots of examples, um, that happens less. So as you have more and more training data, you can kind of work that problem out because okay? these models learn very well. And so you can look more at uh, how dependency parsing works. There are a couple of, of famous group examples like the lexical functional grammar pargram. That is not a typo. Project head driven phrase structure grammar, lexicalized tree adjoining grammar. They have very exciting names, as you can tell. Um, to kind of learn more about like where these systems are and what they're doing with these systems. Uh, I personally also think that Spacey's uh, Prodigy website gives you some really great examples. Don't just Google Prodigy. You end up with the band. Although I'm still very sad. Um, yes, you are right. They are quite, a, they, this is how you can tell that academics wrote it, right? Is that the, look at these names. What the heck? Um, yeah, so Prodigy is like Spacey's like AI modeling tool and has some examples of how all this stuff works together. If you want to learn more, um, I, really, I think their website explains pretty well. Um, and they have some cool videos on how to use their stuff. Okay. So what I would do, I, that's what I would do. But some other things that you can think about is... Um, a way to expand this might be to use some probabilistic context-free grammars, okay? because it, what Spacey is doing, like I said, is transferring the constituency grammar straight into dependency grammar and okay, using this set of rules. So it assumes that their constituency grammar is correct. And um, constituency grammar has its moments, right? We talked about sometimes it attaches phrases in the wrong places um, because of those recursive rules. And so their solution is often what is called a probabilistic context-free grammar, which means that each rule has a specific probability. 
So as, as it's learning, it learns those probabilities. And then when it hits something that sort of matches, it uses the probabilities to pick which one it should be. And so that's better than assuming that every phrase structure combination is equally likely, because that's not the case. Okay. Um, and that's really what neural net models shine at, is understanding those underlying probabilities.